What is up? This is Trip, and you're listening to Homebrewed Christianity. And this is episode one of two for this week. One of two Game of Thrones episodes. So I'll just tell you right now, if um, you're not a Game of Thrones viewer, then maybe this will lure you, uh-huh, call you, bring you in to a decision to, uh, you know, binge watch Game of Thrones so you can join 250 million people that are going to be watching it later this month of April as, uh, you know, the final season approaches. Or, or maybe you're a Game of Thrones, a Game of Throner. You, uh, you regularly go to Westeros in your imagination uh, through a book, through the TV show on HBO, and you're like, I, I want to, I want to know more. I want to get deeper. Well, then you're going to meet my, my, uh, my new internet friend. You know, we hung out on the internet. Name Aaron. He runs the Bald Move podcast community, and they have. My favorite Game of Thrones podcast, um, Bald Move, like, you know, no hair. And uh, they have a whole whole podcast network. Uh, you'll hear more about it in this episode. They do a different TV shows and movies and, and, and all that kind of stuff. But um, uh, on top of being a super nerd, a mega nerd, a professional podcaster who, who launched a whole network of podcasting, you know, with his friend, um, he also partnered with New Testament scholar. Anthony Ladon, and they just released the second volume of a book called Gods of Thrones. That's right. A like professional scholar of religion and the most epic Game of Thrones podcaster, tag team. It's like the Rockers or the Legion of Doom, if you're, you know, of the right age and watch the WWE. It's a tag team meant for the ages, you know? Um, it's like the Heartbreak Kid and Anvil team up. And they're like bringing nerdy religious stuff across cultures, across religions, across history, and connecting it to close to the text and film viewings of uh, Game of Thrones. And like, uh, we're not talking like they just watch a TV show. We're talking about invested in the f- the fan community, all the different fan theories. It's so amazing. Okay, like if you are a religion nerd and li- that. Basically, is everyone that listens to this podcast, given we be, uh, kind of just interview philosophers, theologians, scholars of religion and such. So if you're into Game of Thrones or religion and pop culture, this book is for you. There's a high likelihood if you get volume one or volume two that you'll decide if you haven't started into Game of Thrones yet to watch it. It's a great show. Hopefully you'll you'll hear about it now, and then later this week we'll release the conversation I had uh, with Anthony, the New Testament scholar, at United Theological Seminary in Ohio. But basically, I love Game of Thrones, so it was a blast. Aaron came on, and they wrote Gods of Thrones, which are all linked to in this podcast, and will later this week when you hear from Anthony R. Mind you, go check them out. They're on Kindle. You can get them physically. All right, Gods of Thrones. A period. Ron. Hubbard and Anthony Ladon. They're the authors. Check it out. Here we go. Boom. Hello, everybody. This is Trip, and I'm here with Aaron from Bald Move and uh, my favorite Game of Thrones podcast and co author of the book one and two volumes, Gods of Thrones. What's up, Aaron? Uh, not much, man. Thanks for the very warm welcome, Trip. I appreciate it. Well, uh, you know, Anthony has been on. We got extremely uh, nerdy. What happens when two religion PhDs talk about uh, Game of Thrones? But you, you're the uh, cool person in the <laughs> writing duo. You know, like the, the, the pop culture aficionado, professional podcaster, uh, you know, someone that decided like of all the art we're going to include in this, we are going to have a Kagang Bowl picture. Like, you know, <laughs> so... Um, maybe maybe we could begin with you just introducing yourself. Like, what? Who is a Ron, and how did he end up being a professional pop culture podcaster? So I am a Ron, and I do a host. I'm one of the co-hosts at Bald Move, um, and we've been doing pop culture uh, coverage for uh, almost. It'll be our ninth anniversary here in like uh, March March twentieth something, um, and. 
I got into this when my friend, I got into podcasting when a friend of mine was leaving uh, my hometown of Indianapolis to go to Chicago. And uh, we did the whole like, oh, we'll keep in touch. But I, I mentioned that like, you know, it was like everyone says that, but everyone's lives get in the way. And and he had messed around a couple of years before that, just doing a like a podcast that's player out the forum. I'm like, you know what would be cool is like we just start doing a like a podcast. Like it's like once a week we get together, we talk about something that'll keep us connected. And literally from that, uh, we did 77 episodes of two dudes talking in a microphone about geek shit. And then we did, uh, we decided that we weren't finding an audience. So we're going to try to cover our other passion, television. And we started, um, I think our first podcast, yeah, Breaking Bad, uh, in season, season four. And we immediately found like we were averaging like 500 listeners. We went to 5,000 the first week, like hot damn. Uh, and we went on. After that, that was so much fun. We did Walking Dead. And after that, so much fun. We did Mad Men. And then we did Game of Thrones, I think, the year after. And Game of Thrones gone on to be just a monster, huge hit for us. It's it's by far and away our most popular show that we do on a recurring basis. So, And then, of course, when Anthony approached me last year and says, Hey, have you ever thought about writing a book? Um, I actually had written a book previously on The Walking Dead. Um, and self-published it. And I'm like, yeah, let's, uh, he, he's like, I, I got some religious expertise and you've got the pop culture expertise and I've got some religious, uh, I got some religion in my background too. And it kind of, that, that's how, that's how we got here. Yeah. So, um, when, when in your life did the questions of, you know, nerd culture, fantasy, all that kind of stuff become ones, you know, that you took seriously enough to, create a community online to cultivate conversation around it? It's interesting because I've been a fantasy and science fiction fan since I can remember. Like it started, uh, you know, I'm a Gen Xer. So I remember Star Wars and how big it was and I'm playing with my action figures with my friends and, you know, uh, flooding, fl- going, taking all my figures out and flooding my sandbox and calling it Dagobah. And then when I got into middle school, I got into Lord of the Rings. And that was like kind of my first real fantasy exposure because I mm-hmm. grew up in a, my, my mother was very dim on the idea of me dabbling in the arcane magical, you know, stuff. Like you can really, you can mess up, mess around, get yourself demonized uh, doing that stuff. So I had to. Oh, yeah. You didn't to, know that there were demons in D20s? I, like I if your dice not. has twenty sides, demons. I've Six got one right here. Let, hold on, let me get a hammer. I this <laughs> might be a podcasting first, but like I had that tension where like my mom, I've had a rocket ship on the cover. My mom didn't care what I read, which is hilarious because you get into some Ray Bradbury, Larry Niven holes, and it's like interspecies sex and demon possession and conjuring, and it's like yeah, the the spaceships weren't any safer, mom. <laughs> than the, the the golems and goblins but i that was like my first real love with fantasy so um you know and i loved the you know when the, the lord of the rings theatrical release came out i had a second love affair with that and i got way into the original source material and I bought a whole bunch of tolkien compendiums and read a bunch of wikis and um then when i heard game of thrones i was like well this sounds like you know a more adjur- a mature adult tolkien and yeah. Um, so it's I, I've been I've been into science fiction fantasies from from a very very young age and creating community around this. That's such a it's like I'm very proud of Baldwin community. We're very we do a lot of uh, we're known for our positivity and our camaraderie and our support for each other. And um, yeah, like I said, I, I I couldn't be prouder that we got this nice community around this kind of like awesome uh, communal watering holes type of thing. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, some of the people that listen to this podcast are professional community organizers or faith community organizers and that kind of space. So for someone who people who value gathering people for community to lift each other up, make a difference in their community and things, what have you learned in creating a space online for that to happen? Because a lot of the old school communities haven't ever you know, really got along with web 1.0, let alone like, uh, that, like the idea that thousands of people are interacting online, listening to the after shows after each game of Thrones with you, you know, connecting on, you know, on, in social media, becoming friends, that kind of thing. Man, I don't know what to say except for I've been a citizen of the internet um, since I was like 12 years old. Like I, I got, I was into the BBS scene and so this, some of these like, 
text only gateways, the things like finger and, uh, what was that? Uh, some, some of the really early search stuff that you had to use, we had gopher and it was just, the web there wasn't even the web yet. You had like gopher and FTP and stuff like that. Um, and I have had the pleasure of meeting people in real life that I'd only ever met on the internet, um, mm-hmm. dozens of times. And now it, it's a, a common occurrence where like, uh, you know, my, my co-host Jim will go to a city for a convention or whatever. And we always host a bald move meetup and inevitably we get a few dozen people that are our fans that have come out to meet us. And I always remark about how it's you, I have yet to be shocked by someone who shows up in real life and be like, Oh, this person's a total whack job lunatic. And I would never hang out like you, the, the person that you choose to portray online in a community that you trust, I think is sometimes more of a true self than you show at your work or certainly environments like church or, or school or where, where you could be judged by like the mm-hmm. things you say. And, um, so like, I, I find that like the, the online communities, I'm not going to say that they replace everything that real life, you know, meetings and relationships, you can't give a hug through, you know, the internet, for example, he's haven't figured out how the, the, the work, the hug box technology yet. But, uh, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know what your experience is, but I found that like online friends and real life friends, some I've, I've transitioned where some of my online friends have become real life friends and vice versa. I, I find it, it's very blurry for me when I talk about some bald move people that have been around for years and years and I'm on a first name basis with them. I consider them as, as much as friends as anybody that I used to, you know, hang out with in Indianapolis. I moved to Cincinnati. I talked to, the, I, I talked to them more than I talked to some of my real life friends. So yeah, yeah. I, I know how it can feel eye rolly. But I do think it's it's like you're really it's divorce of what the person looks like and sounds like. It's just you're interfacing with their intellect, and mm-hmm. I think that's there's something really nice and kind of true about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and I I mean my experience. I mean we I've been doing the podcast for eleven years now, and over time more and more people you know with that length get into the kind of inner circle of the community. People and we do events all over the country, and when I go speak places or whatever, hang out with people, and it's uh, you know, I think that uh, too often in our in in our world, we don't have the ability to kind of get past the positioning of yourself yeah. in the group you get, mm-hmm. and you know when you go into a community that's built around something super particular, like you can do on the internet, right? Like there's no town in America where there maybe Los Angeles or New York, where as many people that listen to your podcast about game of Thrones that take it that seriously, that immediately are going to live stream it or listen to the podcast the next day could get together and hang out. But on the right. internet they can, or like a 90 minute conversation every week with a religion or philosophy scholar, like, like, you know, even at the biggest religious communities, there's only two or three super nerds in the whole thing. True. Let alone like 70,000 of them or whatever. So like, like, and I feel like when you have the more particular the group is online, the more you think, oh, we actually share something in common. So now we can actually be our full self. Yeah. And I think it's, it's crucial that like that, that time shifting that you're, you're kind of hinting at because like having a podcast or a forum or anything online is kind of like having the, the bar cheers. That's, that's always open and it's always happy hour. It's always that best hour when Cliff gets there and Norm gets there and Sam serving drinks because you know, everyone, whether you listen to it, uh, whether you're in Egypt and you listen to it 17 hours after released or whether you're uh, Eastern, Eastern standard time and you're released, you're watching us record it live. Like you're all, everyone gets the same experience and then everyone can go to the forums and, and talk about it. So like the, these, the, what, what would be like uh, you, you meet your friends at a bar at 6 PM on Thursday becomes like something that like people can do all week long and keep continue and keep, keep uh, furthering conversation. And that's like you said, you can't, you can't do that. Like if you miss, if you miss meeting your buddies Wednesday night for beers, you done missed it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't you can't holographically participate it uh, a Friday evening when you do have time. And I, I think that's uh, that, that's that's one of the cool things about uh, being an online citizen. Yeah, I mean, it, well, even with your Game of Thrones podcast, until last year, I lived on the West Coast, and I would turn my phone on airport uh, air, mm-hmm. airplane mode when the East Coast version of Game of Thrones started. And right. uh, then, you know, get the kids to bed right. and then watch it on the West Coast, then turn it off, 
download your podcast and then have listen to y'all while I do dishes. Nice. You know, and so like, uh, um, you know, it was, uh, and I knew plenty of people have, you know, different rhythms of certain podcasts, but you're, you're like, I want to watch the, the, you know, the episode experience it without mm-hmm. knowing anything. And then, mm-hmm. Uh, I want to listen to the podcast. I know a bunch of my friends around the country listen to so that the next day we can all comment about it. Um, yeah. And I, that's the thing is like, not only do I create podcasts, but I'm a con- big consumer. Like I love Dan Harmon's Harmontown and I love to try to watch it live, but it, it it's on so late because it's a West coast show. So a lot, I do the same thing where like I have a moratorium on going on the Harmontown subreddit uh, between like Sunday and Tuesday night, because I don't want to, I don't want to get, I definitely want to be part of the conversation, but I want to join the conversation once I've, you know, uh, once as I've consumed the media that we're all consuming. So, Mm -hmm. so when, um, so when did you become like a professional podcaster and how do you explain that to people? Cause I still haven't, I still haven't figured out how to do it because someone's like, so are you a professor? And you're like, well, I adjunct, which kind of uh, means it's a hobby that I had went in a lot of debt for. Right, and, right. Like I do podcasts, but then I also go speak places. I write books, and basically every month, I'm not sure how I'm paying my bills mm-hmm. technically, mm-hmm. but it kind of mm-hmm. works out, you know. Like, but what do you do? Things on the internet. Like yep. I, I still haven't figured out what the what to say about it. Man, I it's it's a big problem talking to my family, you know, because they're older people, and like my dad still doesn't really under. He's always like, I I think he's just this year stopped worrying because I've been doing this for, for so long without any visible means of support that he kind of trusts. But like the idea that you can talk about television into a podcast, uh, blows blows his mind. Uh, let alone that you can parlay that into a living. But we about uh twenty fourteen. We started, so we started in 2010 and around 2014, we, cause we first just did it and we didn't care about making money for like mm-hmm. the first two years. And then, you know, we got enough bandwidth and we started hitting like, you know, serious numbers with the television stuff. Our bandwidth bill started being, you know, uh, a couple hundred dollars and we're like, shoot, well, uh, that's starting to be a little bite out of the old uh, Magic the Gathering uh, funds. Uh, maybe we should uh, get, get an Amazon affiliate account. And we started doing that and a couple other things like, you know, ads here and there. And it started like generating modest amounts of, of money. I remember uh, like one October where we, you know, because we used to really try to do some interesting Amazon affiliate things. Like we did costumes of Breaking Bad. And we like sourced all the different things on Amazon. If you want to like want to wear Walter White's pork pie hat and like a stage mustache and the particular sunglasses he wore and the jacket, like we had all that stuff sourced. Or you wanted this, the particular Tyvek suit that they wore with the actual filters. And if you want to not spend the seventy five dollars for those filters, here's the five dollar ones. That look, at. we did that, and like we made like three thousand dollars in one October just on affiliate. And we're like, hot damn! What if we did this real? real what if we did this like for for our full-time job instead of just like what so we started doing that we did a couple kickstarters to try to like you know our deal is like you know baby steps so like before a season of um a show started we'd have a kickstarter for it saying like if we raise x amount of money these are the extra things we'll do we'll do an instant podcast right after we'll do like uh, you know just a bunch of different you know how kickstarters work yeah yeah people and we'd made you know we made like five six thousand dollars per and i'm like okay if, if we can make that kind of money each season of television we coverage well that so so we went full time and quit our jobs and we almost went broke for three solid years like literally we we had this spreadsheet that would show like our runway and the spreadsheet would continually predict that we'd go broke and bankrupt in six months that was the joke like six months we'd grow enough that we avoided it but like last year is the first time we ran that calculation and it showed us as having like a, essentially an infinity runway. Our burn rate had finally mm-hmm. sunk below. We grown and like bandwidth goes up and then bandwidth goes down and the, the club members grow up and our support. Are, so, so we now seem like we're going to be in business indefinitely, but, but it's podcasting. So who knows? Uh, but that's kind of been, it, it was a scary touch and go two and a half, three years uh, to get to where we're at. Um, and I lost a lot of money the first about a year of operation that I'm still kind of paying back to my credit cards and my home equity loans and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but it, on the other hand, what job can you get paid for to watch Game of Thrones and talk about it with your, your buddies on the internet? Uh, so there's definitely advantages of it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, 
you know, one of the things that um, one of the things that comes to mind is as someone with different shows around different shows, Mm -hmm. um, different podcasts, obviously around different TV shows. And then you have like movie shows and stuff like that. Um, What, when you look at the different communities that form around individual like types of content and then the larger community of all the bald move stuff, how do you see those interacting? That stuff is, I think is the fascinating part about running this is to see where all the inlets and outlets are. Um, yeah. and you know, we do surveys, uh, you know, usually about once a year where we try to find that information at, cause it's so, it's so interesting and useful for us. Um, and, uh, so we have a couple advantages we've been doing. We were one of the first, like when we started doing breaking bad, there was only two other podcasts doing breaking bad. If you can believe it, there was these two guys in Alabama. Uh, I think it was behind the cutting edge is what their podcast was. And there's the official one with uh, Kelly Dixon, the editor of Breaking Bad, having on Vince Gilligan and whoever she could grab from the production side to do a podcast and throw it up. And the audio quality wasn't great on those. You know, by the end of Breaking Bad and season, at the end of season five, there was like 30 podcasts. And like, there's got to be 300 Game of Thrones podcasts right now. So, but, but we've been doing it from the beginning where there wasn't that competition. So we have like this, like usually when we push in onto a show, we have, we're going to be in the top, five-ish podcasts. So we get a lot of organic growth there. We also do movie podcasts. So a surprising amount of our traffic, people discover us like we have, if you search for Pulp Fiction podcasts, we are the number one result. And we're like that with a bunch of different things like Inception. May I think we rank really high in Godfather. So people are just kind of like in getting into that. There's a couple of different endpoints. We have big popular TV shows, big popular movie discussions. People find us and it, you know, it's like, oh, I discovered you when I was looking for a good pop, pop, pop fiction podcast or, hey, I joined uh, when, you know, you guys were the only game in town of left, the leftovers. And then there's then like this relationship, like we were inspired by the guys who run Penny Arcade and Jay, Jay and Jack on podcasting. Um, and we have since inspired several, there's several podcasters who were kind of like the pod fathers of, mm-hmm. um, and they have their own little thriving communities and stuff. Um, like the no ship network and the Nattercast, um, uh, uh, um, the, 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 the pro- project fandom, um, kind of like our, our p- people that we've worked with and kind of, were fellow fans and stuff and mm-hmm. it's neat to see that. And like just yesterday I got someone that emailed me and said a year ago, I asked you some technical questions about microphones and cameras and I, you gave me a lot of good advice. And now I've had my first year and we just hit 5,000 subscribers on our feed. And that feels incredible. There's a lady that runs a gymnast podcast that, uh, you know, has kind of modeled our club in the same way we modeled our club after Penny Arcade's club. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's cool to see, like, you know, we've stood on the shoulders of podcasting giants and, you know, benefited from the expertise to kind of pay that back and see people following and, and where it's going. Um, like, I would never guess I would inspire to gym this podcast uh, to be successful and, and be self-supporting and, and doing that. It, it, it's 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 cool i hope i answered that that yeah. question all right yeah so um w- like maybe you can uh introduce for us that uh especially those who you know have uh either listened or about to listen to uh anthony and i talk about all the different uh super religion scholar nerdiness that happens in game of thrones but h- how do you how do you introduce game of thrones just as a cultural experience and a cultural moment that this many people are wrestling with these stories and using them to reflect on all sorts of ethical questions and political questions and still just how gross incest is. Man. Uh, so what's interesting about Game of Thrones is what a crossover success is. Uh, it is because, like, for example, my co-host famously hates fantasy. He just does not like it. He's a science fiction fan, first and foremost, and grudgingly will sit through a fellowship uh, if he has to. But like most of that swords and sandals and dragon stuff, he has no use for. And I remember like Bill Simmons, who, you know, is famous for founding uh, Grantland and being on uh, ESPN. And and now he has the ringer. He I remember listening to he was like he would talk with Alan Sepinwall, which is another noted television podcast. And, you know, at the end of the podcast, they're always like, so what what should I be watching? And Alan's like, should check out Game of Thrones. And Bill's like, ah, it's one of those walking through the woods shows. I, I, I yeah, I can't get into that. And the next season, uh, after enough of his friends have bullied him to it, he's like, holy cow, he's all about Game of Thrones. 
because like Game of Thrones doesn't care if you like dragons or magic. In fact, you won't even know that it's got dragons and magic until like the very end of season one. I guess there is a little bit like you, like there's a five minute sequence that kind of, oh shit, there are like ice zombies and stuff. But then you go the whole rest of the first season and it's all yeah. political intrigue. It's all, it's like the, it's got like the, the complexity of its political intrigue and scheming and social economics is like the wire. Mm-hmm. But also there's dragons and there's shadow babies popping out of uh, witches' vaginas and things like that. That then and there's crazy blood spattering gore and, and and sexuality and there's like something for everybody and there's 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 also characters that appeal to just about everybody mm-hmm. um you know like like this is just got a cast of fifty you will find one person that you say ah I feel like it's what what it's like to be in this person's shoes or I've been. Uh, which sounds funny in a show that's all about, you know, castration and murder and incest and conquest and rape. But but that's true. Like you, you, there's, you'll find someone in the, the, the victims or the vanquished or victorious that you can cheer for. And I think that's um, uh, that that's the secret to its success. Mm hmm. And um, and and I think definitely like we're at a, a cultural moment with TV shows where a greater percentage of people binge watch TV shows, and sure. there's so much space between seasons of Game of Thrones that yeah. each time uh, there's like a whole new herd of people that you know are ready to watch it live. You know that and it grows. Yeah, and before the advent of like Netflix and Amazon and HBO Go, uh, it was always. Uh, a truism that shows would start off and they build an audience, but then the audience would decline each season because like if, if you wanted to get in on lost, um, maybe lost is a bad example because they had blockbusters and DVD rentals. But if you want to get in on X files and season four is daunting because how much of this do I even watch? If I wanted to watch it, where the hell do I watch it? I got to borrow it for VHS. I got to catch reruns. Like it's maybe shot out of order. So like as consequence, those shows got less and less. And the modern streaming era has turned that on its head. Like game, like Breaking Bad got doubled their audience every single season from season three on. Mm-hmm. Game of Thrones is ridiculous. They started off with like about three million people watching it. They're over a hundred million worldwide last season, counting all the different ways you can watch it. That's insane that you 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 have that kind of geometric growth as this season. But but it's because. And I'm expecting there might be 250 million people. There might be a quarter billion people watching Game of Thrones this year because it's been off the air for two years. And it's not. It's all that people talk about. Mm-hmm. So it that 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 just throws fuel on the television brush fire when you can at any time if you've got a weekend, if you got the flu, and you've been hearing about the show that everyone's talking about, you can with the tools at your disposal instantly plug into that and start burning yeah. through it. Um, oh, yeah. And it's it's really and that's why this is one of the reasons this is the golden age of television. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, and and then there's the easily accessible content surrounding it, right? Like so, yes. um, there you can watch an episode, listen to a podcast about it, and that kind of thing. Because some people th- about Game of Thrones that I you know I've turned on to it, have watched it, got liked it, and then you start to talk to them, and they missed half of it. Like, right. you know, because, well, they, a lot of times if you're not comfortable with fantasy literature and the way that characters connect and how you signal yep. stuff, like I just remember one of my best friends, uh, and he's a PhD in, in like philosophical logic, really smart guy. Right. He's like, so who's Jon Snow's parents? And you're like, yeah, you know, <laughs> are you watching this? What? You're yeah. like, <laughs> he's like, I, I got confused. I just, I like the yeah. fighting. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a, you know, one of the one of the things about uh, that has kind of framed the whole show has been the actual game, the political game around mm-hmm. the thrones, and then this external uh, threat that's coming. Yeah. Um, like, how do you like? What do you think about that? Because I I feel like that's one of those points when you're starting to wrestle with what Martin's doing with the story. There's so many different trajectories that fans that take it seriously can take it Mm -hmm. it's interesting because like uh, that's something we ask with that's the the way we frame that question is what is martin playing at Mm -hmm. uh you know is if because because eventually and i I think that's it's one of the common refrains here from game of thrones fans nowadays is like oh there's not as many surprises there used to be it's like well no joke this is now the end game you can't kill 
major characters that, that you know, someone has to finish the plot, right? Someone has to be alive to take the ball and spike it in the end zone. So like all these crazy deaths, like I'm sure there's going to be some brutalities ahead because like, now it's the end game and some people are going to die, but also a lot of people are going to live and it feels more like you're watching a machine that's already wound up just kind of play itself out because you are, you are. Um, so the big question is, is Martin going to continue to subvert expectations up to the end? How is he going to do that? Um, you know, what is the deal with the White Walkers? Because, you know, one of the one of his Martin's thesis mission statements is when he sat out intentionally to create kind of like a, a, a more cohesive version of Tolkien's mythos is that he didn't like the trucking of like absolutely good and incorruptible and absolutely evil and, ev- and irredeemable characters. And he wants to live in those shades of gray, which is more realistic. But you've got now John and Danny versus the White Walkers. Pretty good. Inc- I mean, Danny and Danny's got a rough, rough spots. But like the White Walker just seems like he's just uh, he's a chaos monster wants to kill all humans. Like there's not a lot of nuance there. How is he going to inject some nuance into that? If he de- also the intrigue of the fact that the showrunners are finishing this series before the books are done. Yeah. So whatever Martin intended, who the hell knows if Dan and David are going to actually do that? Um, is it a metaphor for global warming? Is it a metaphor for thermonuclear weapons proliferation? Is it is it going to be a uh, you know Danny sitting on the Iron Throne with her king consort John, or vice versa? Or is it going to be some form of democracy? Because how do you break the wheel? The wheel is never going to be broken if you just have this hereditary monarchy. So is there going to be some kind of proto democracy flourish in Westeros? What it's Martin's tease is going to be bittersweet. What does that mean? Like. I mean, my, my guess is there's going to be some form of very early democracy uh, that, that, that Danny is going to, for whatever reason, not be able to have kids or there's not going to be a, an heir. So there's going to be some form of like parliament or house of lords or, or something that's a baby step towards the people having the power. Because that's one of the other, you know, like the parable of Tyrion where you've got a sellsword, uh, a merchant, and a priest, and a king, and they all say, kill, kill one another. What is the common man? Who, who, where does he see the power lie? Well, one way is to pivot that is the power lies in the common man. If he's the one that can, can assign who he believes has power, then doesn't he have the power? And you know that's very natural thought for us in 21st century, broadly speaking, Western uh, culture. Um, but that's super new thought for like a feudal society. So yeah, yeah, that's kind of like how I see the tensions and, and the end game of Game of Thrones. Well, and, and one of the things, and you kind of hinted at it, is how the shows uh, intentionally co- or intentionally complicates characters. So you can't put them in like, oh, this is one of the, the this is on the good team, this is on the bad yeah. team, yeah. which means that uh, the solutions all people are na- I mean we're naturally desire a clean story and a nice ideology that's fit and a solution um you can see it in our contemporary politics or religion or whatever and uh one of the reasons i think the show's so intriguing is it kind of keeps peeling the onion and it doesn't get more simple it gets more complicated right and even the people you think in one season are given the best advice and have the best perspective then get played in the next mm-hmm. and the the desires you think of that are good in one case then turn to be ugly or 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 impotent in other right. situations right yeah no that's um that's exactly right. Like Danny, you know, she frees all the slaves in the continent of Essos, but she also like crucifies a hundred dudes. Uh, she's here to liberate uh, Westeros from the truly diabolical Sir, uh, La- uh, Lannister regime. But she burns two, uh, you know, the characters tallies. who, two who are are kind of acting upright in their own eyes. Now, like you know, uh, uh, it's, uh, Sam Tarley's dad's kind of a dick. But Dickon, his son, doesn't seem like he is. He seems like a perfect fine guy. I enjoyed him very much in Umbrella Academy. Uh, so, like, there's that kind of, like, you know, clat- and, like, because no one, I don't think anyone in this world, except for maybe uh, you, you, people want to throw in Jesus Christ or stuff like that, no one in this world has, is blameless and upright all the time. Uh, so I, I, I like that. Like I, I identified that myself. Like there's moments, uh, you know, I, I formerly had some pretty, you know, prejudiced and ugly beliefs, uh, that came out of like the very conservative fundamentalist, uh, 
um, sector that I kind of emerged from religiously. And mm-hmm. I feel very ashamed about some of the things I said and did and thought back in the day. And uh, I'm kind of on like my own little redemptive arc. Uh, mm-hmm. And that feels that feels real. It feels like it's it's a other layer of realism that like Star Wars doesn't have that that Tolkien's uh, um, Lord of the Rings saga doesn't have. Um, and it's kind of the hallmark of the golden age of television where you've got very complicated situations and, you know, it's daring you to condemn a character just so they can redeem it. And Game of Thrones is like everyone's favorite character or a lot of people's favorite character, Jamie Lannister, is introduced to us as he's throwing a child out of a tower and trying to kill it ends up paralyzing him. Um, but now, like, you know, everyone's, oh, Jamie, is he going to be okay? Is he going to... How does how do the how do they pull, pull that trick? Um, it's 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 hard to say. Yeah, I I mean, I I once I started coming back around on Jamie. It wasn't till uh, you know, he's in the castle with Lady Tyrell and she's doing the whole kind of like you know you're a fool in love with Cersei. She's going to be the death of you, and you kind of get for that moment just from like watching his face that he like it cracks through for a moment and he's kind of is able to see himself as right. uh, this person with this like, you know, litter death behind him. Yeah. Uh, and that he hadn't even been noticing because of his love for this woman. And then right after, you know, she uh, pulls him close after uh, Tyrion had been, you know, snuck on or whatever. Right. And she's like, do not betray me again. Mm-hmm. You can kind of see those two conversations with powerful women. He's mm-hmm. just like caught in the middle of, yeah, and uh, it's it, it, his character is pretty. Uh, I, I that's one of the reasons I like him as a character. Well, and you're you're tempted to think of uh, Jamie as this like this entitled shit, right? Um, but you think about how he was raised. Like uh, he had very strong convictions and wanted to be this great heroic figure uh, as a as a teenager, and he gets inducted. Like imagine you're you're inducted in this order when you're 14 and you're you forsworn the ability to hold lands and have children and have a mate and because he's all about like you know being this protector role and this this knight he believes in it and his and then at his his pinnacle of heroism when he single-handedly saves king's landing from the mad king heiress condemning all the population to death by wildfire he's reviled by all of the lords and knights and like he's profaned his profession because he's now the king slayer and he was supposed to be the king's guard like you think about like what that would do to you if you're 16 years old uh like what kind of skew it would have on your moral compass to like hey my society says i'm supposed to keep this man alive but he's going to kill a million people men men yeah. women and children if i don't if i don't act and he he takes what is unquestionably a morally correct decision and and suffers uh, ultimate, uh, ultimate personal cost for that. Like, I mean, not ultimate. He didn't die, but mm-hmm. you know, lost a lot of prestige. He's got people steering behind his back. He's got guys like Ned Stark besmirching his honor. That's so. Like, you don't know that when he's throwing the kid out the the window, but when he's you know in the 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 bath scene with Brienne, and when he's talking, is that you, you come to appreciate that he's got his own torture. He's got his own baggage. He's like he's come by all this pathos honestly. And and that's what's that's what's so great about even the villains of Game of Thrones is like you can squint and be like, man, if I was in that situation with and dealt that hand of cards, am I one hundred percent sure that I wouldn't have played him that way? Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of times it's like you, you, it's it's hard it's hard to condemn outright or praise outright any, any one character. Oh no, I I think that's uh, I think that's a, one of the best parts about the story itself yeah. is that you know if you. You know, you went through um, what I imagine your parents and my grandmother's like checklist of evil things in the show. They're like, right. oh, uh, let's look at the sins or yeah. whatever. Then there's nothing redemptive about the story itself. But if right. you if you if you are uh, observant about what the story's doing to you and what uh, kind of slant on the world it's offering, um, it it's one where in the end you you take a perspective recognizing just how much our situations determined by where we find ourselves in the world, right. what house we're in, what yep. position in power we are, and if we're a bastard or not, and all yeah. that kind of stuff. And um, I think that, in a sense, it's actually cultivating them, uh, the viewer to be more humble and graceful in their Indeed. life. 
And I, it's like, it just shows that like you, I think that um, a lot of people, especially in, in prosperous first world nations, they have this kind of like, you know, if you do good, you'll have good outcomes, but reality you know, where you, in, where, where you go in life is, is a, large, a, a large part determined by where you started. And some people have a real tough uphill climb through, by, through education, uh, or I guess it would be through, climb through ignorance, through poverty, uh, physical inf- infirmities or problems, mental and emotional infirmaries and problems. And not everyone starts off on a, le- a level playing field and not everyone's born with the correct views and born with the perfect morality. And I actually... Um, you know, like, 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 I think it's, I think it's much more inspiring to meet like a, like, like non homophobic person that came out of like Mobile, Alabama Mm -hmm. than it is to find someone in LA that's always never had a problem with the gays. Like, well, congratulations. That was kind of the viewpoint handed to you. This other person has actually done some wrestling and, and probably over, you know, overcome some prejudices and stuff. And that I, I think, to a large extent, doing that makes you stronger as a person. The, like, then the person has never had to test any of their ideals until much later in life. Um, yeah. And Game of Thrones is, like you said, I, I, I think you're right. It, it teaches a certain humility about redemption and concepts of grace and, uh, and, and forgiveness and what are the lines between forgetting and forgiving and, and um, really, int- like really interesting moral complexities that if you eschew things like Game of Thrones as a way to maintain your purity... Sometimes I feel like it's it's kind of like uh, living in a biological bubble, mm-hmm. you know. Like you, you you need a strong immune system, and how are you going to get that if you don't uh, roll around in the dirt every once in a while? Mm-hmm. Maybe an imperfect analogy, but uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, so um, I was uh, talking with uh, other super nerds who, and I said that I know like your podcast. And um, I was like, so what should I ask Aaron if, you know, the, the, there are three topics. You can say whatever you want, but, you know, if you haven't watched Game of Thrones and take it seriously, then you should just all catch up. The, you're, feel free to be as spoiler as you want okay. or to make reference to the books. Um, so if you don't want anything ruined, um, you should all go rewatch things now. But um, we, we were discussing in the uh, – um, one of the homebrewed message groups of uh, you know, the members and stuff. So one of them asked, like they've been rewatching what, what should we be thinking of that moment uh, in um, where John sees the depictions on the wall of like uh, the, the, you know, the forest folk and the, and humans, the children, and yeah, human, the children yeah. of the forest, like, and like what, ha- how is that that plot of the past being brought into the season? Like, how should we think about it affecting things? Well, there's a there's a good question, and I can't give a comprehensive answer, but I'll give one that's probably not true, but it's interesting. Uh, <laughs> there's been well, a that's long. That's what every preacher does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's there's a lot of there's there's been a, this interesting like fan theory that. Because, like, you know, what are the motivations of the White Walkers? Um, you know, the show, it seems like the conventional wisdom is that they're essentially like Terminators that have gone amok. That uh, the children of the forest uh, were getting their, getting their butts handed to them by the larger, stronger uh, first men that had migrated from, from Essos uh, thousands of years ago. And they're, they're, getting, they're getting beat. And as a last-ditch effort, they, they capture a man and they turn him into a White Walker to kind of be their champions. Um, there's a, a couple theories that suggest that there's actually, you know, something deeper that like uh, what happened with the children in the first men eventually is they formed the pact. They fought each other to a standstill, formed the pact where the, the first men would adopt the religion and ways of the children and let them have the forest and the mountains and the streams. And the men would take the sunny areas of the world, the fields and the, the plains uh, and to make their homes and that they kind of live in peace and harmony. And there's a suggestion kind of like... Um, like like in 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 the 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 remake of Battlestar, mm-hmm. where there's like that outpost where once a decade the humans and the Cylons meet, and they just because they had this war and then they had this truce and they had this pact. That there's this this theory that suggests that um, the wall is kind of like this ancient DMZ that is from an ancient, truly ancient pact between the children and men and the White Walkers and. 
that there's some dark elements to that. Like there's a certain amount of tribute um, that the that the pe- the men were supposed to give to the White Walkers so that they can reproduce because apparently that's the only way they can they can do so. So there's one of the things is as men forgot their role and they forgot that what the purpose of the wall was, um, and they stopped doing those those sacrifices um craster the the diabolical craster who was giving his male children to the white walkers could perhaps be the last living man that was keeping the old ways keeping the old covenant uh when he gets stopped from doing that suddenly the white walkers like they had already been upset and they were kind of like marching forces but that's when they start marching south there's a theory that like maybe we're actually in breach of an old contract and mm-hmm. it's the White Walkers are actually here to to extract retribution for us going back on our word. Um, and I, I, like I said, I, I especially in the show, I don't think they're heading that way because of whatever they're doing is a much more simplified version of what Martin had in plan because Martin didn't finish his books. But I think it's still a st- strong possibility in the first. And maybe that is to suggest... It serves dual purposes. Number one, to to... Uh, so, so John knows that this is something that's happened before, and these are the weapons that you can use against the enemy, which is weird because they also have Sam that could have told him that. But also, I think it might be a wink to the book readers and to the theorists that like there might be something more to this, like you know, ancient compact because like there's a commonality of language there and and symbols that the the children and the and the the White Walkers are using, suggesting some cultural exchange. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. No, I, I, I mean, I think it's fascinating. So second question is, if I had $10,000 and I was going to drop it on who ends on the Iron Throne, who, who's Aaron going to uh, suggest, um, you know, when I, when I go to gamble online? I think this is like betting red or black, and it's uh, red is Danny and black's John. Um, I think one of them will probably be the, the fact like sitting on the iron throne. I think that there's going to be some kind of arrangement where Tyrion is kind of like a prime minister. Cause again, I'm always leaning towards proto democracy. Mm-hmm. And before, like a lot of times I get pushed back with like, you're not going to get any kind of proto democracy from a feudal society, blah. there's no precedent, no bullshit. The night's watch already democratically elects their leadership. It's one man, one vote. You can't get more democratic than that. The iron Islanders democratically mm-hmm. elect their King at the King's moot by popular vote. Um, book only, but there's a, several of the free cities like Volantis that holds elections like every two years and they've got political slogans. They got the elephant party. They got the tiger party. They campaign like there's a rich history of fledgling de- democratic styles of governance um, in, in Westeros already in Essos already. So I think that if this isn't coming out of nowhere. This is actually a natural evolution out of, and it's interesting that, you know, Danny's coming out of Essos. So she'll, and, and also her, her background as a, as a uh, Valerian Valerians, uh, also democratically elected. They had like, you know, the, the different houses would, would be elected to, to, to lead. And there was jockeying of power there. Um, so like she comes from that tradition, Jon Snow from the Night's Watch comes from a democratic tradition. I think it's going to be a case of, like peanut butter and chocolate getting together and making a Reese's cup of, of something even better out of those two, two traditions. Um, but, uh, that's, that's where I'm, so I, I, I would guess that like John is the head of state or maybe Danny. And I think the other one's probably going to die because that's where the bitter and the bittersweet ending that, 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 uh, uh, Martin is going to give us, but honestly, I think it's a 50, 50 bet on, on those two. All right. Well, um, the, so which do you think it's more likely? Uh, there's like a significant scene with a dire wolf going badass, or Tyrion rides a dragon. I think Tyrion riding a dragon died with, uh, the Syrian, uh, when, when he got turned into a white Walker dragon. Uh, cause like, it did seem like that the dragons have three heads was heading towards like a, maybe a John Danny tr- Tyrion triumphant. Uh, and there's lots of hints that in the books anyway, that the Tyrion himself might be a secret Targaryen and much so he might be the bastard child of the, the old mad King, the same way that the, mm-hmm. you know, John is a secret Targaryen. Um, but yeah, in the show, I just don't see, cause there's only two dragons. And if you've seen the trailer, when I saw the two dragons like flying together and you know, swooping through the canyons, I'm thinking, oh, those are those. That's John and Danny riding and doing like some kind of lovebird shit. Uh, so I don't see. I don't think there's any room for for Tyrion other than to be kind of given jealous, jealous, perhaps jealous looks at, at John and Danny. So I'm gonna go. 
direwolf badassery because if you do a frame by frame analysis of the trailer for the season the upcoming season there's a hint of a large wolf that's kind of rampaging through one of these battle battlefields so is it is it Namiria coming to save the day? Is it John? Are we finally going to get to see Ghost after I've not seen him for like two, three seasons? I don't know, but like I, my money's on Dire Wolves. I uh, yeah, the whole time when they're fighting that stinking like uh, zombie bear, yeah, and you're like, you have a Dire Wolf. It'd Where's nice your dire, wolf? dire Wolf? Yeah, yeah, yeah. For for real, I don't like, know. And and you can't tell me the show's not making enough money to to have a right. a badass Dire Wolf. Right. And if you just wanted to, like, dire wolves are cool for tattoos. If you like mm-hmm. the show, dire mm-hmm. wolves are cool for toys. Yep. Like, I just feel like, uh, you know, the, maybe the prequel, when they do the prequel shows, there'll be more dire wolf. Cause I'm thinking that, like, one of the, I was just discussing with Anthony and I, one of our preview podcasts for a book, Gods of Thrones. And he, I mentioned, uh, we were, we were joking about that. And I think it's like, it's been so long since we've seen a satisfying direwolf scene that like, I think that uh, they're whipping us up into a frenzy. So when we finally see a direwolf kicking ass, there'll be tears of joy over a lot of uh, nerd faces. Uh, that's the only thing. Cause like, yeah, like if you, cause there was two undead polar bears, if you can animate two undead polar bears, you can for damn sure animate an undead polar bear and a very much alive albino direwolf. So yeah. Where's the, where's the, where's the, even if they were budget strapped, which as you point out, no way, like the, the, these, these episodes just cost a hundred million dollars an episode and still be profitable for, for HBO. Like where, where's the dire wolves? Where's the dire wolves at? Yeah. So, um, last thing is w- how would you give the invitation to people that aren't super religion nerds into reading gods of thrones? Like, um, if they, if people listen that are, uh, you know, they'll heard Anthony and I's conversation and, and, and it was a blast for those that love Game of Thrones and are thinking about it on the edge of their seat. What what's the lure to hit? Yes, okay. here's here's my pitch. George hasn't written a book since season two of Game of Thrones. There hasn't been a new season of Game of Thrones for going on two years. This is fresh Game of Thrones content. That that is available for you to read right now, and it's it's not just that. It's I, I think it's really truly interesting because, and and this is this project is made possible because George does uh, operate this way. That he freely admits that what I do is I go through and I steal other religions and cultures. I file the serial numbers off. I chop shop them. I combine them, and then I give it like a neon paint job. And there is my religion. There is my culture. There. That's why it feels unreal but very like very real um and so to understand like ned a character ned and john snow who are very rooted in the religion of the old god and the old ways to understand someone like uh, jack and hagar and their faceless men and and where they you know they that that that, that religion was born in the slave mines of the volcanoes of old valeria um to to understand those characters it'd be like trying to understand any person like a, a, a political figure that's a, a very devout Christian, if you had no idea what Christianity meant, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so we use both uh, detailed sources from the books and the TV show, um, and the extra material that George Martin has provided, and like there's there's treasure troves of information. The thus spake, uh, so spake Martin Martin archive. We've got, poured through all this as well as uh, Anthony's real world expertise in ancient religions. And we have come up with some really interesting analysis, like uh, an, a, analyzing Jack and Hagar as if he is a djinn or a genie, um, mm-hmm. you know, seeing Ned as like a druid, um, so, uh, looking at uh, Danny through the lens of her role as uh, essentially the head of this dragon cult uh, that is historical from the Valerians and also just she's kind of like living embodiment up right now. Um, like looking at the, and we even have a chapter where we call like the faithless and the skeptics, which is about th- got people like the Hound and Tyrion who have renounced rel- the religions of their time and are skeptical of all that. And what does that mean? And what does it mean when a skeptic like Tyrion becomes a believer in something? Those are very in- inherently interesting stuff. Plus, uh, we we as, as as well as the the heady kind of like research and and, and material and the real world religion. We also try to blend a lot of humor. Uh, every chapter has a fan theory section where we can kind of get crazy and talk about Tyrion being a time traveling fetus, or is Varys per- per- per potentially a, a mermaid? Um, is Roose Bolton a vampire? We do those each chapters to make it extra fun. And 
we have phenomenal artwork yeah. by by Chase Stone, who's a noted fantasy illustrator. If you've played Magic the Gathering, if you've read The World of Ice and Fire, half of those illustrations in that book are, are of him. Turns out he was a Bald Move fan, and he, he gave us a discount on his spectacular art. And we've got six just jaw-dropping pieces of original uh, art inspired by the world of, of uh, Ice and Fire, and they're just amazing. They're just the, the cover and the interior art that he did with us are amazing. Um, and I can't wait to get a merch store so I can start selling posters and t-shirts with it too, because, uh, some of that stuff is just like, especially cause we did, we tried to do, we tried to stay off of Martin's toes as much as possible. So like we had him illustrate, uh, some concepts, like there's a really cool, uh, like centerfold spread of, uh, egg on the conqueror with his two sisters landing on the sept of Dragonstone and, and praying for the first time before the sept. Uh, for their blessing to conquer uh, Westeros, and you see, there. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's just amazing detailed spread of the architecture he did at Dragonstone and the detail he put on the dragon. And then we have, you know, we illustrated the Clegane Bowl, which mm-hmm. is what might happen when the Hound clashes with his undead brother, the Mountain. And that's not, you know, that's not officially illustrated because it's a fan theory. Um, there's a lot of really cool, like like the fans are going to think this is very cool that you can't find anywhere else. Um, and I'm really proud of of the yeah. art Stone did. But if there's no Clegane Bowl in the final season, then especially after they set it up last last season, where the Hound went up to his brother and said, "Yeah, I know about the Clegane Bowl. It's on my calendar. We're 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 doing it, buddy." Like if they yeah. don't do it after that, like if they just let that die. But yeah, you can't ring the Clegane Bowl bell and and take it back like that. So yeah, but you know, you know, you can also make a whole new trilogy of Star Wars and really only have Luke in one of them. So I I don't doubt the ability to disappoint expectations. True, that's true. That's true. (laughs) You're like, so you have all the original characters and you're gonna kind of use them. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You, you you never you can never, especially since this is such a weird project. It's it's a book series that's incomplete. <laughs> that the source that the the adaptation is going to take and slam dunk like it's so weird. I don't I don't know. Is this this is kind of unprecedented in literary history? Is it not? Yeah, I I, I mean it. You know when uh, when HBO needs a new season and uh, Martin is uh, busy writing back history. Yeah, it just they pass each other in the night. Yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a interesting. That's like that adds the extra juice because about half of the spoiler edition. So we do uh, we do three podcasts a week: the instant take, which is what we do right after the episode, the main episode podcast that comes out Tuesday afternoon. Then we do what we call the spoiler edition on Friday, where we talk about book stuff and stuff that maybe not is not privy to. The, at least half of that podcast is people navel gazing about, you know, Martin and what it all means. And should I, you know, which, which is the re going to be the real version? Will Martin ever finish the books? And that stuff adds a lot of juice to an already interesting plot line uh, uh, on its own. Oh yeah. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, hop on the internet. No, it's been it fun. Up. It's been fun trip. Thanks for having us on your show. Oh yeah. And, uh, everyone, uh, anticipate the arrival of a new season. And uh, and make sure you check out uh, what, the Bald Move website. What is it? Uh, BaldMove.com and Gods of Thrones is available. Volume 1 right now on Amazon.com uh, and Volume 2 will be available early in April in time for the new series to start. All righty. Excellent. <laughs>